Hi, I'm Gareth Green, and in this video, we're going to be working on how to write a two-part canon at the fifth. Well, the simplest kind of canon is when one part begins and then a second part comes in, repeating exactly the same notes as the first part at the same pitch or maybe an octave apart. But you can also do this by having a canon where the second part follows the first part at a different interval. And often one of the most common intervals that works well is to write at the fifth. In other words, <clears throat> we're writing maybe starting on C in the first voice. The second voice comes in, but starts on a G, a fifth above that C. And you could write it above or below, it doesn't really matter. Well, in this case, we're going to start with the bass part, this is going to be a two-part canon. Of course, you could write more than two parts, but this is just to kind of explain the technique, really. And we're going to start in the bass part, and then the upper part is going to be the part that follows in canon, but a fifth higher. Okay, so we have to make a few decisions when we're writing in canon, like, okay, well, the first voice is going to begin. When does the second voice begin? It might come in even one or two notes behind the first. It might come in the next bar, the next measure. It might come even later. So in this case, let's have the second part coming in two bars or two measures after the first part and see how that goes. But I'm going to begin by writing some notes in the original voice. So how about we write something like this? It's going to be in C major for simplicity. If we start on C and then we do something quite distinctive, like we have two beats on each of the first notes and we go from C upper fifth to G. It kind of makes for a bold statement at the start. And then having had this kind of disjunct movement, we could then write something that's more conjunct and then maybe have a slightly faster moving rhythm so that this is not too slow. So how about we then proceed like this? OK, so there's the beginning of my canon idea. And you can see how this is constructed. It doesn't have to work like this. But this canonic idea has got what we call a head and a tail. There's the head. There's the tail. So the head is doing something quite distinctive. Slow notes, disjunct going from the tonic to the dominant. The tail is moving faster and is all conjunct. So you don't have to do that, but it makes for an interesting variation even within that original idea. And it's often something you find in fugue subjects that you can talk about a head and a tail. And there's something distinctively contrasting the head and the tail. So writing canon is all useful background to writing counterpoint, writing fugue, and just sort of thinking about things like this head and tail idea, uh, about how you contrast the rhythm between the head and the tail, how you contrast the conjunct and disjunct movement is something that maybe is going to make for a more distinctive opening idea. OK, so that's got us started with a musical idea. Now, the thing you want to avoid doing is to carry on writing the bass part and then hoping as if by magic when you write the top part, it's all going to fit the bottom part. If you write the bass part now and then you try to, to write it two bars or two measures later at the fifth, uh, it's probably going to have all sorts of clashes and things that don't work harmonically. So here's my kind of tried and tested technique for writing canon that's, if you like, safe on those fronts. Because you're writing two linear lines, but they've also got to fit together harmonically. And you've also got to think about how the two lines match each other harmonically, but are also a little bit independent of each other at any given moment, even though the same material is playing out. OK, so if we're going to start two bars or two measures into this, then the first thing we need to do is put some rests. Now, the next thing we need to do then is to copy out what we've done in the left hand into the right hand. If this is indeed a piano piece, could be something else, but we'll treat it as a piano piece. But all these notes now going up a fifth. So that original C is now 
a G and I'm going to go up a fifth to D. Then I'm coming down a third to B. And then I'm thinking about how to transpose the rest of that up a fifth until we get to D. So now we've got that going. So, so far we've got this. Now, having got that far, we can then think, lovely, let's start writing the next bit of the left hand. But we're going to write it so it's got some independence from what's now happening in the right hand, in terms of rhythm especially. And also thinking, are we writing something that's going to play out as the upper part? Or does it just sound like a bass line? In which case it might not work quite so well as an upper part. So these are the things you've got to be cognizant of. OK, you can see I purposely went for um, three beats on this note because there are two beats there. So it's going to give us a little bit of independence. So how about now we move the left hand on the last beat of the bar, the last beat of that measure, because that's where the right hand isn't moving. You get the idea. Now I'm going to sort of just think a little bit harmonically about treating that A I've just written as an upper auxiliary note uh, in relation to that third measure that all looks like chord five really. So if it's an upper auxiliary note or an upper neighbor tone, I'm going to have to come back to G. Well, that works well because if you write in thirds or six with the upper part, that's usually a good move. But just be thinking what's happening harmonically. Well, that's looking like a chord five, so that's good. So can I carry on in thirds? Well, yeah, that's going to go to a chord four. But I don't want to make the mistake of having all of the left hand in this measure in quarter notes or crotchets, because otherwise the rhythm gets a bit tedious. So let's at this point introduce a passing note, a passing tone. So we then go down to D and you see it's quite a useful way of having something that's working a third apart, switching to working a six apart, especially if the harmony plays out. And, and then, you know, what can I do next? Well, I could carry on working a six apart. And then, you know, does all this work harmonically? Well, we said that's an upper auxiliary note or an upper neighbor tone. This is suggesting five. This is suggesting four with a passing note, passing tone. This is probably suggesting a seven in first inversion. And this is suggesting a one in first inversion. So I think that might work quite happily. And then just to carry on a moment longer, if that is now going to do that, well, we might as well move on to an F there. Because there are three beats in this upper part, I'm just going to make sure that F is a shorter note in due course. And then, um, you know, it will keep busy in the left hand while the right hand is stationary. OK, so you see how this is going. So now we want to kind of get this mapped into the upper part. So my next job is to transpose this material up a fifth into the upper part. So that's going to look like this, isn't it? So you see what I'm doing here. And hopefully you can already hear that this is going to work quite well melodically. OK, so uh, we've now got this from the beginning. OK, well, it's uh, still a bit of work to do on this, but you see how the canon at the fifth is playing out quite happily. OK, so now we've got to get something going in the left hand. Now, I said we were going to try and keep a little bit busier. So why don't we now write some quavers or some eighth notes? We'll have a nice bit of sort of conjunct writing. So we can come down to here and then maybe come back there. That kind of works quite well harmonically, doesn't it? 
<clears throat> okay. Um, let me explain why that works quite well harmonically. Well, we've got these two parts, the six apart, which is carrying on from the six apart stuff there. This is looking like a, a two in the first inversion, passing note or passing tone, harmony, passing, harmony, because this is now looking like five in the first inversion, followed by one. So harmonically, it's all making sense, isn't it? Um, okay, so that's all good. So what does the right hand now need to do? It now needs to play out the transposition up a fifth of this. So you see what I'm doing? I'm now mapping on from a couple of bars before, a couple of measures before. And then we're almost at the end, aren't we? Now, when you get to the point of you know, come to the end of the piece or the end of the section of the piece where you've got to kind of finish the canon, haven't you? And we're really going to want to end on a chord one. So I'm just sort of thinking, well, let's go to a note that belongs to chord one. It could be C, could be E, could be G, whatever. But um, E will do the trick, won't it? Now, of course, at this point, effectively, you know, the canon has come to an end, doesn't it? Because um, the, the right hand is now just sort of finishing off, but the left hand has already finished, if you like. So at this point, you probably find you've got to go to, into something that's slightly freer in the left hand, that's in keeping with the style of the rest of the piece. But you don't want the left hand just to stop and let the right hand finish on its own. So you can't continue the right hand any further. So we've just got to fill in the missing bars with something that sort of fits with the rest of it. So I'll change color to show where the canon finishes and where we're now writing freely. And again, thinking in the same way, does it work harmonically with the upper part? Have we got rhythmic independence? Well, the upper part is kind of reasonably busy. So the lower part can be slower. Second half of the measure, well, the right hand slows down a bit. Well, the left hand could speed up a bit. So how's about we do something uh, like this? You, know, you see how the rhythmic independence plays out. Then the right hand gets busy, so slow the left hand down a bit. We're on the approach to a cadence, so a bit of stepwise movement won't go adrift. But then it's quite a handy thing to do this hot cross buns at the end, where you go, Upper dominant, lower dominant, tonic. It's a very typical bass line that just happens to fit with what we're doing upstairs. Okay, what's the harmony doing? Well, this is a chord five. That's a passing note or a passing tone. This is chord four. This is a lower auxiliary or a lower neighbor tone. Um, this is sort of suggesting five, seven going on there. One in first inversion. Passing, four, passing, and then really a sort of five, seven to one, giving us a nice cadence at the end. So you see how that upper part has mapped the lower part, two measures or two bars behind, and is presented a fifth higher. So canon at the fifth. And then when we run out of steam, because the right hand has now got to the end, the left hand has to just finish off slightly freely. So how does all this sound when you put it together? So I hope you can hear that that actually works, doesn't it? Now, it's partly the melodic design, making sure you've got a melodic line that's got something to say, that works as an upper part and as a lower part, that all the harmony is sound, that you get rhythmic independence. So you can almost feel a conversation going on between the two parts. That really firms up your canonic technique. And you see how we've constructed that by kind of working it a bar or a measure at a time and then mapping it onto the other part. So we're continually 
referencing that. And you can hopefully see why if we'd just written all of the bass line and then expected the upper part to work in canon at the fifth, it probably would have been a bit of a disaster. That's why a lot of people uh, get in touch with me and they say, I've been trying to write canon. Sometimes they say, I've been trying to write canon for years. Never managed to write one successfully, so I've given up with it, or I don't think I'll ever be able to do this. And as soon as you get into this way of doing it, just thinking in fragments at a time, it's amazing how it can liberate the ability to write canon. Well, if you found this video helpful, let me invite you to the Music Matters website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. If you click on courses, you'll see we've got lots of courses out there, lots of different musical subjects. So have a good route around and see what's useful to you. A lot of people trying to do this stuff are saying, well, I just wish I could do this with greater facility at my fingers. Well, if that's the case, our keyboard harmony might be a really useful course for you. It really is taking you through uh, the basic kind of knowledge of harmony, and then it develops into more complex chromatic chords and so on, um, and really gets you to do this very practically under your fingers. So you can really think in chords, think a bit more independently between your hands. That will liberate you as a sight reader at the piano. It will also truly liberate you as a composer, arranger, whatever you're interested in doing. So let me highlight that course, but have a look at what else is there besides www.mmcourses.co.uk.